Hey, y'all, you listen to the Gary Owen Podcast. <laughs> Hashtag Get Some. Hey, what's up, everybody? This is uh, Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. As always, you can listen to this on iTunes, or you can go to my YouTube page, youtube.com backslash Gary Owen com. That's youtube.com backslash Gary Owen com. Uh, start with my schedule. This weekend, I'm in Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, January 31st to February 2nd. That's Thursday, Friday, Saturday. There will be no show Sunday because it's Super Bowl Sunday. It's crazy because comedy clubs, they will be open on Christmas. They will be open on New Year's Eve. They will be open on Easter. They'll be open on your birthday. They'll be open on Hanukkah. They'll be open, but they, they are not open on Super Bowl Sunday. That just tells you how much. It's, it's a national holiday. It really like people should be off work Monday. They should be allowed to be off work on Monday, uh, because of everybody's gonna have Super Bowl parties. And I bet you, if companies was able to um do inventory and 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 how do you say it? Uh, I don't indoctrinate. Um, I don't know. My GED just kicked in. One of those big words. They was able to document. The, their work days, I bet you the Monday after the Super Bowl is one of the most unproductive work days when it comes to any kind of job. I can almost guarantee that. Uh, I'm going to get into that in a minute uh, because as as the Super Bowl is here, uh, I can't believe Tom Brady's in his ninth Super Bowl. He's 41 years old. And we should know by now, do not bet against Tom Brady. Because even last year when they lost to the Eagles, uh, it wasn't his fault. He threw for 500 yards. The Rams, DB, the same guy that had the penalty, that should have had the penalty against the Saints, where he face guarded, he helmet to helmet hit, any pass interference, with none of them was called. Nickel Roby Coleman, he says, yeah, definitely, it, def, age has definitely taken a toll on Tom Brady. He is not the same quarterback he used to be. Why the fuck would you try to pinch the bear? Why would you do that? I, I, you just be complimentary. Even if that's how you really feel, don't do that. Because you know Tom Brady's focused, but you think he's extra focused now. And it's not even Tom Brady you got to worry about. It's Julian Edelman. Because Julian Edelman is the one that's all fiery and emotional. And I guarantee you, mark my words, when I come on the podcast next week, they're going to have those players mic'd. And at some point, Tom Brady's going to throw a touchdown to Julian Edelman, and they're going to make a first down. They're going to do something. And Edelman's going to be on the sideline. He's going to look at Tom Brady and be like, looks like you slowed down, old man. Looks like time is cut up with you, old man. Guarantee you he says that on the sideline at some point during the Super Bowl this Sunday. Mark my words. Shut up. If I'm on the team, if I'm on the Rams, like, dude, are you fucking high? You're the reason we're almost not even here. You should just shut up for the week. But you don't do that against Tom Brady. Are you crazy? Are you crazy? Uh, I'm going to get into more of the Super Bowl in a minute. But as uh, I, I'm just, I've been, I've been busy all day. I haven't been online. Uh, and we, we take this on Tuesdays and it airs Thursdays, my podcast. But just as I'm literally driving to, to record this, uh, I'm on Instagram and I sell these pictures of Jesse Smollett from Empire. And I'm like, why? I, I, first, I thought when you see numerous people post pictures, first thing goes to your brain is hope he didn't die. Because usually it's like a rest in peace type deal. And I'm like, what happened? What happened? And I guess he was the victim. Not I guess. It happened. He was the victim of a hate crime in Chicago. And I'm, I'm going to read what CNN just posted. Empire actor Jesse Smollett was attacked uh, was attacked was attacked in the early morning hours on Tuesday in what Chicago police are calling a pace a possible hate crime. There's no possible it was. Smollett was attacked by two people yelling out racial and homophobic slurs and poured an unknown chemical substance on the victim. And from what I've heard, it, it was bleach. That's what police said. According to the police, one of Smollett's alleged, alleged attackers also put a rope around his neck. Both fled the scene. Uh, he, Smollett took himself to Northwestern Hospital. Hospital is in good condition. Uh, 
And so, yeah, he's he's healthy. He's okay, but uh, but mentally that does something to you. Uh, you know, I I guess the guys they said this is MAGA. I've also reports they said this is MAGA country. Um, and it, for those who don't know, he's he's a homosexual male. Jesse Small is homosexual black male. So, which isn't easy in this country uh, when you have both of those things. I don't even want to say against you, just both of those things are who makes you, you. And I just, I'm, it's, I don't know. It's, it's almost surreal to think we're in 2019 and this type of stuff is still happening because, you know, I don't know him that well, uh, Jesse Small. I mean, I've seen him out, social events, things like that, but, uh, I've never heard anybody say a, a bad word about, about him. And we run in the same circles. And nobody I know has ever said a, uh, had a bad thing to say about him at all. Uh, so the fact that they did this to, you know, for all intents and purposes, a good guy, uh, a decent human being, one that has never been in trouble, one that clearly isn't going to start a, converse, uh, a confrontation, and you feel the need to just attack him. And I guess that, to tie a noose around the neck is just, uh, I don't know. It's just, it's disheartening is what it is. Uh, I, you know, I'm pretty sure they'll eventually find the guys. Hopefully they find them before this podcast airs. Uh, but it's just, it just shows the, uh, the ignorance that's still out there in this country. And then it's a, it's a big city too, like Chicago. I think that's what shocked me was where it took place at. I mean, Chicago's just got so many different races, races and religions and nationalities. And they're just, I mean, you, you go downtown Chicago, I mean, you're going to see everybody. You're going to see Muslims. You're going to see Jewish. You're going to see tall, short, black, white, Indian, Asian, uh, Latino. You're going to see everybody. And the fact that this happened in one of the major cities, major melting pot cities is scary. Uh, so I just, I hope he's okay. It is. It's weird when you get jumped, man. When you get jumped like that for no reason, it's a it's a weird feeling, and it really it it does something to you uh, mentally. And I think we're in a, a a day and age where therapy isn't looked at as a bad thing anymore. And he's clearly going to need some kind of therapy after this to to deal with what he's going to deal with internally, because we can sit here and be angry and be mad. But he's got to live with this and he's going to have to replay what happened to him in his head over and over again. And I, you know, it's, he's going to, he's going to take a look over his shoulder anytime he's out at night again. I mean, anybody's walking towards you, it's going to, you're going to do a double take. Uh, I've been, let me see. I got jumped one time, uh, one time. And it's, it's weird when you get jumped because it's one of the things like, do you fight back or you just try to protect yourselves? Or do you try to get away? Uh, the, the, the one time I got jumped, uh, I was in San Diego at a frat party. And it was, it, was a, it was weird because I went there to go watch a boxing match. And I was playing on a flag football team. And we went there to go watch the, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Sugar Ray Leonard and Macho Camacho. I was young. I was like 20. And... Uh, I left my jacket in this guy's room in this frat house. And a buddy of mine that I was on the flag football team with, he was DJing the party. So I, I don't go to San Diego State. I had no affiliation with the frat. I had nothing against them or for them. I was just there. So then I'm hanging out with my buddy who's DJing the party. So I'm ready to go after a couple hours. So I went back to go get my jacket. And at this point, the frat party's in full swing. I mean, there's people partying. There's There's girls there there's guys and it's young too so they got this one freshman dude that's trying to join the frat he's blocking the doorway to the bedroom where i need to get my jacket so i tell him i said hey man uh i'm about to take off i need to get my jacket he goes oh i don't nobody can come back here i said no no you know i i don't i'm not part of the frat i'm not trying to go in anybody's room i just gotta get my jacket i said you can come with me he goes i can't leave the door and i guess there was it was like a it was a, he was blocking the hallway to get to the room. I'm sorry. He was blocking the hallway where all the bedrooms were. Nobody could go back there unless you were a part of the frat or you were in the bedroom. Uh, so 
as I'm having a cordial discussion with this guy, this other guy who clearly was in the frat, he just yells at him, hey, you fucking plead. We told you nobody back here. So now the freshman comes to me. Now he yells at me. I told you, motherfucker, you're not coming back here. I was like, what the fuck just happened? And so then I he put his finger right, right at the edge of my nose where I thought he was going to touch me. So I grabbed him, not to throw a punch or to beat him up. I just grabbed him like to keep him away from me. And the minute I grabbed him, it was fist of fury on Gary. There were people coming from left, right. I don't know where these punches were coming from, but it was it was overwhelming because it's unexpected. So what I did, I grabbed the freshman kid that was that was in my face and I pulled him in front of me and I leaned down. I didn't go to the ground because I didn't want to be on the ground because I could get kicked. So I leaned back almost like a, almost like you're doing a wall sit at the gym. They say lean down. But I got him in front of me. So all these frat guys are trying to hit me, but they have to literally go around the freshman to get to my head and I'm blocking them. And then like two guys come in like, hey, bring it up, bring it up, bring it up. Two of the guys that clearly were seniors or helped run the frat. So it gets broken up. And now they got me like, one guy's got a hold of the back of my shirt and he's kind of dragging me out of the frat house. And then right as I was getting let out, some son of a bitch hit me over the head with a beer can, like bam on the back of my head. And I just went, you motherfucker. So, so I hadn't thrown any punches back, but I was just trying to protect myself. So then I get out to the frat. Keep in mind, I still ain't got my jacket. I'm trying, I still want to get my jacket. It was a leather jacket that I paid like $300 at a time in my life where $300 felt like 3000 So I need to get my jacket back. So I'm still sitting in front of the frat house like, and now they're like, we're going to call the cops. I said, please do. Please do. I said, I haven't been drinking. I didn't do anything wrong. Please call the cops. So they're now they're trying to tell me I have to leave, but I'm on the sidewalk. You can't kick me off the sidewalk. So uh, just then, two black guys roll up that I played flag football with. Now, the guy DJing the party is a black dude. I'm a white dude, obviously. Now these other two black guys show up. They came to go to the frat party, and they were on the flag football team with me. My flag football team was all Filipino and black guys. I was the only white guy on it. It was a bunch of Filipino dudes and black dudes. So... They said, what happened? I said, dude, I just got jumped. I'm just trying to get my jacket. And they go, what? They said, come on. <laughs> they walked me. The two black guys walked me into back into the house. And of course, the frat, out, the frat was a white frat. So now they see these two black. Now I'm 6'2". One brother with me 6'4". The other one's 6'3". They're bigger than me. So they're walking me into the party. We literally get in the middle of the dance floor. And they yell out, who the fuck Jump my homeboy. Who the fuck jump my homeboy? And now the DJ, who's my friend, was playing. He stops playing. Er, what happened? And I'm like, well, I got jumped. So now I got three black guys yelling, who the fuck did it? Right? And the one dude, I never forget, goes, Gary, just point somebody out. I, I want to knock a motherfucker out. Just point somebody out. All the frat guys ran to the rooms. They locked themselves in the rooms. And they're going, we didn't know, bro. We're sorry. We didn't know, bro. <laughs> and so you got these three black guys that shut this white frat house, frat party down. And now all the white guys are locking themselves in their room. And they're saying like, we didn't know. Cause you keep in mind, there's people at the party, but they're not all the frat guys. So if you, you know, it's not like the frat had 80 guys in the frat and they ran from three black guys. No, 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 no. The frat house probably had, you know, probably six guys that lived in that house. And then you got another probably 15 dudes that are in the frat or trying to join the frat. And now you get in the rest of the 40, 50 people at the party had nothing to do with it. They're just partying. They went to San Diego State or friends of friends. And, you know, so if we had, there was 50 people at the party, it was a good guy to girl ratio. It was probably 25 guys, 25 girls. And so now they're locking themselves in the room. So long story short, I got my coat back. And no other punches was thrown. And then the DJ packed up his shit and left. And then the two brothers left. And we just went like to Pacific Beach, San Diego and went partying. But it was just funny how they walked me back in to think about that. But it's crazy how that's the, that was like the one time in my life where I literally just got jumped for no reason and didn't see it coming. And it's crazy because even to this day, 
Every time I walk into a party or a nightclub, I assess everything as soon as I get there. I'm not one of them dudes that comes into a nightclub on 10, ready to party, turn up. I literally walk in and I look at everything. I don't care if I had one drink, 10 drinks, no drinks. I literally, every time I walk into a room, I kind of assess everything going on in the room before I really start to have a good time or quote unquote turn up. And it all stems from getting jumped at that frat house in San Diego. Because I was, you, this the thing is, you don't ever realize how fast shit can happen until it happens. Because that whole story I told you was longer than the fight and me getting walked back into the frat house. All that shit happened probably in three minutes. The dude got my face, motherfucker, I told you. Uh, all of a sudden, I grab him just because I don't know if he's about to throw a punch at me or what's going on. And then I'm getting hit from every direction. That shit probably lasted less than 30 seconds. Then they're escorting me out. I get hit with a beer can on top of my head on the way out. Now I'm out front of the party and I'm probably out front two minutes. And then the brothers showed up. They want me back in. So I bet you all that shit happened so fast. Uh, and it just it hit me. I go, wow, shit can really go left really fast. And I, I don't know. This story is all going to play itself out. But I bet you, you know, whatever happened to... Uh, to Jesse in uh in Chicago, I bet you it was fast. I bet you he never saw it coming. Those guys are just kind of, you know, they're probably laying in wait. And he, he they I, I have a hard time believing they were just waiting on a on a on a random black person. I bet you they had him scoped out just be, because of who he is. And mm, I don't know. I bet you when all plays out, it, he was he was definitely a target. It wasn't a random black person. I bet you they had this plan. Ugh. I, I'm, I'm, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Um, I'm just, uh, I can't. The, the curiosity's got me. Like, I want to know who did it. Like, very badly. Like, who did it? Uh, well, I mean, we know, we know why they did it, but I want to know who did it. And I'm not one to run to conclusions and jump and attack everything and. Just because they got a, they got a, they say this is MAGA country. And of course that's, that's Donald Trump, but I'm not quick to, to just blame Donald Trump on this one. I blame him because he has created this divide in this country and he's made it. Oh, it's, he's made these, these, what I call closet racist. He's made them more, you know, vocal and feel like they can get away with more shit. Yeah. I blame him for that, but I don't want to just jump and be like, I just, just saying if, if it was a black guy wearing a, a Barack t-shirt and they jumped to, and two black guys jump a white dude and they both got Barack Obama t-shirts on. I'm not condemning Barack Obama because of that. Uh, I think they, you, you do that because you know, it's going to get a reaction. And so I just, I think I want to know who these two guys are. I'm blaming these two guys, but I see a lot of people on Instagram uh, blaming Trump. For this, uh, I just want to leave Trump completely out of it. Like, just I don't want him to have anything to do with this. I want to catch these two dudes, and and you know they get dealt with accordingly after that. But I think Donald Trump is if he doesn't speak out on this, you know he he was quick. This is going to tell me a lot about Donald Trump. He was not that I already know everything about him, but he is quick to. When the shit happened in D.C. last week with the, the the kids from Covington Catholic High School in Kentucky and the the Native American and everything that went on at the Capitol, he was quick to defend those kids to say they didn't do anything wrong. They just stood there. Uh, I hope he's just as quick to condemn the two individuals that jumped Jesse and to reach out to him to make sure he's okay. That uh, hopefully that'll happen before this podcast airs. If not, it tells me a lot about about Donald Trump, and it should tell the country a lot about Donald Trump. If you have any any questions about it, because uh, I've never I told somebody the other day I was like I've never seen a time, uh, and it started with Barack, and now it's gone into Trump. Where if you supported Barack, you supported him, man. He couldn't do anything wrong, and if you didn't like Barack. He couldn't do anything right. And it's the same with Donald Trump. Trump supporters, he can't do anything wrong. And if you don't like Donald Trump, he can't do anything right. I don't remember any presidents 
like that bef- before Barack and now Donald Trump that it's been like that. I mean, even with Bush, it was, yeah, Bush is, you know, I don't like him, but, you know, I, he's, you know, he does some goofy shit. You know, uh, Clinton, even if you didn't like Clinton, you were like, I don't like him, but that was cool. What he did there. And then that was playing a saxophone. That was, that was cool. I didn't see him doing that. Uh, Reagan, uh, the other, but those are the only presidents I can remember in my, in my lifetime. But I don't remember two presidents back to back like this where either you, they can't do anything right or they can't do anything wrong. I just, I've never seen it, you know? And with now with uh, this hate crime that happened and then they yelled out, this is MAGA country. I, I'm anxious to see what the Trump supporters are going to say. And, Cause I already know what the people that, that don't like Donald Trump, what they're going to say. That's been very clear on my Instagram post. Uh, so I, I mm, we'll see if he speaks out and reaches out to Jesse. Cause he sure as hell reached out to the kids at Covington Catholic high school in Kentucky. And he sure as hell made sure that they, uh, they knew it wasn't their fault and they didn't do anything wrong. Uh, and again, what the heck Jess, Jesse do wrong? He was just walking around at 2 a.m. in Chicago uh, and he gets jumped. So, yeah. So maybe I, I, I take that back. Maybe, maybe uh, I said, I don't want to bring Trump into it, but it, clearly he has to. Uh, huh. It's going to be interesting what he does over the next couple of days. Uh, so, so I'm just glad Jesse's okay. And, uh, you know, he's, he definitely has to get some therapy because that's going to that's gonna stay with him for a while. I can't even imagine. I can't imagine how your stomach would drop uh, when you're getting jumped like that. Because one, when it happens and it happens so fast, you don't know if it's two guys, three guys. You don't know if they're going to bring a weapon out. And God, what, what goes through your brain? I can't even imagine. And I, I'm a white dude, so I, I, there's no way I can know what it can feel like to have a the noose tied around your neck. That's just a whole nother level of just just mental anguish that's gonna go that he has to deal with now. And now uh as I'm doing the podcast, I guess uh Lee Daniels is hiring armed guards to protect the cast of Empire. Ugh. That's a goddamn shame. It's come to that. That's a goddamn shame, man. Uh so I I guess I'll move on. It's hard to segue out of that. It really is. Uh, God, especially in my line of work, because I am in the inter- entertainment field. And, you know, I'm in, the, I'm, in, I'm in the black entertainment field. I'm a white dude, but I'm in black, I'm in black Hollywood. So, I mean, Jesus. It's just, ugh, just ugly, ugly. Especially someone like that, who nobody has anything bad to say about. I've never had anybody ever. I'm thinking, nah, never anything bad to say about. You know? Uh All right, well, I guess we'll move on to the Super Bowl. It is Super Bowl week, and you would be, I don't know, I don't want to say a freaking idiot, but you got to be crazy if you're going to bet against Tom Brady on this one. Uh, This has the, honestly, I could be wrong, but it kind of has the makings of a blowout. It has the makings of a blowout. And I'm rooting for the Rams. I can't stand Tom Brady. I can't stand the Patriots because they're good. That's the only reason I don't like them because they're freaking good. I couldn't stand the Bulls when they had Jordan just because they were good. I got no other reason. I don't hate anybody on the team. I don't dislike uh, their coach. I just, they're good, and I want to see them get beat. I want the Rams to win. But if you you asking me to bet the house, I'm betting on the Patriots and Brady. And as soon as Nickel Roby Coleman said, age cut off with him, I said, oh, shit. If I'm in Vegas, I'm uh. I'm betting on the on I'm definitely betting on uh <laughs> I'm betting on the Patriots. It reminds me of I went to a fight years ago, and I'm not gonna say who because I don't want to throw any I don't wanna I don't want to throw anybody on the bus. But uh me and my wife are at a bar because in Vegas, none of the big fights can be shown at the casinos. So you you gotta go off the strip and find a sports bar. So we're at a sports bar and we're watching the pre-fights, the preliminary fights, and the the main fight hasn't come up yet. And all of a sudden, these four dudes walk in, and they look like gangbangers. And we're sitting there. It's, the bar's almost all white, and these brothers walk in, and we had a big table. And I literally looked over, and they, I made eye contact. You guys can sit here. So they sat down with us. So fast forward an hour and a half later, we're cutting up, drinking, you know, having fun, getting ready for the main fight. And literally one of the guys, I said, what do you guys do, man? 
Now I'm asking questions I shouldn't ask. He goes, yeah, we uh, we just came with some some girls, you know, brought some girls up from L.A., you know, to, 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 to work this weekend. Oh, so they brought some girls in Vegas, you know, ba- basically they brought hookers in Vegas because it's fight weekend. And some fighters brought out more hookers than others. Uh, it was notorious when Mike Tyson was fighting that a hooker that went for 50 bucks was going for 500 the week of a Tyson fight. That was notorious back in Tyson's days. Every, every, every hooker went for higher money when Tyson fought. He made the economy just better in Vegas. Everybody won. Everybody won when Tyson was there. Uh, so we're there for a fight. These guys tell us they brought some girls for the, for the, the, you know, the, the fight weekend. And, and it wasn't a Tyson fight, uh, disclaimer. Uh, but anyways, he proceeded to tell us that one of his girls sucked one of the fighters dicks last night. And I went, what? He was like, yeah, uh, yeah. One of our girls took care of so-and-so last night. I said, I'll be right back. I ran down to the nearest casino and put a thousand dollars on the other fighter. <laughs> Cause I was like, that dude ain't focused. That dude's got a dick suck last night. <laughs> I was like, and sure enough, he lost. Not going to say who, not going to say what happened, but he got knocked the fuck out. <laughs> it's like this. Oh, thanks, guys. <laughs> and I just remember, so the fight's over. I'm high-fiving these dudes that look like bank gangbangers. You know, they're just, they're, I'm high-fiving them like, thanks, guys, I won. And then they paid, they, they picked up the tab. These dudes, they, they, me and my wife, all our food and drinks, they took care of us because we let them sit down with us. Not let them sit down, but we invited them in to sit down with us. And then I remember telling my wife, goes, man, those guys must be balling out of control, man. Because I never forget the, the dude had a Lincoln Navigator and it had TVs in it. And so this is, I'm not going to say, it was years ago. I didn't have a lot of money back then. So I'm looking at my wife like, damn, those guys are doing it, man. They got some loot, got some girls, man. They doing it big. We drive by a Motel 6, and there's that Lincoln Navigator. I was like, oh, so they're, okay, they're balling on a budget. <laughs> so they did bring some hookers from L.A. or some high end, but they were clearly staying in a Motel 6. Because I was, there's no, it was out of a movie. Like, I looked at my wife, I go, eh, and then literally look over, and there's the Lincoln Navigator. Because when, oh, because when the fight was over, we all left together, and we were waiting on our cars to, to get pulled up. The valets were pulling up at this sports bar. And so... When I saw their Lincoln Navigator get pulled up with the TVs and everything, I was like, dang, they're doing it. <laughs> and then literally we they pulled out, we pulled out behind them. And when I saw them pulling to a Motel 6, I went, what? Looking back on it, they could have just been picking up one of their girls from a Motel 6. Maybe that's where she was at. But it looked like they was going in there. Uh, I was like, my wife was like, mm, balling, huh? I was like, ah, okay, I'll take it back. But man, I sure appreciate that little tip. I sure appreciate that little tip. Speaking of boxing, uh, the hometown guy, uh, Adrian Broner, uh, I think I think I talked about it last week. I'm gonna let that go. I'm gonna let that go. Uh, I just I saw Showtime does this cool thing because they used to do they used to do 24 seven on HBO, and it was always Floyd and and Mayweather made that show. But then when the fight was over, they never did a follow-up. Showtime, what I like about them is they they do like all access, they call it. So they do like two or three weeks before the fight. But then when the fight's over a week later, they air the all access epilogue, they call it. And to, I like watching those because it gives you, it shows you the weigh-in, it shows you the fight, and they get can they put cameras on the fighters' families. And then you get to really get a sense of what's going on emotionally with fighters during the fight. So I talked about the Adrian Broner fight last week, but it was funny. I watched the Showtime All Access and they did the epilogue. And it was, you could see Pacquiao's family and Broner's family during the fight. And you literally saw like, at first Broner came in and go, I won that round. I won that round. He's in the corner. And then he went and came in and he goes, I won that round. I won it. So you could see mentally he was keeping track round to round and it goes into his psyche of why he probably thought he won the fight. And, and then you literally, there was one time he caught Pacquiao a little bit and you saw him like, yeah. 
And then they were like, just throw some more punches. You hear them yelling, throw some more punches. And he just, he wouldn't let his hands go. And then you hear his corner basically saying, you know, you got to win this round. You got, you got to let your hands go. You got to let them go. When, when a corner says you got to let your hands go, they're basically saying you're losing. You got to let your hands go. And the 12th round, he didn't really do that. And you heard his family, his fiance and his mom and, and another lady in the front, in the stands. Once they got an interview on Pacquiao, then Jim Gray was about to talk to Adrian and you heard his family go, oh, we don't say nothing crazy. And then the one goes, well, you know, Adrian, it was almost like, I hope we don't say nothing. <laughs> sure enough, Adrian got up there. Boom, boom. And you could almost, then they go in the locker room with Adrian after the fight. Now, Pacquiao won the fight. So I'm always more interested in the fighter that lost the fight. Like mentally, what, how do they process everything? So Pacquiao, of course, it's, it's joy, it's happiness, it's we won the fight, we knew we were going to fight, blah, blah, blah. Adrian, you see him, like, you see the mental process of him coming to grips with, uh, I, I think in his heart, he didn't think he won it, but he said it initially when the, when the fight was over in the ring. I think at that point, he believed it. But then you see him literally in the locker room saying, you know, I won that fight, man. They ain't trying to give it to me. And you don't see anybody, like, agreeing with him. Like, you don't see his corner men, his homeboys. They're just listening. And I, and you see Adrian, he, you're kind of looking for, I think as a fighter, you're looking for validation after a fight like that. You're looking for your corner, but yeah, you beat his ass, man. They robbed you completely. Everything's quiet. It told me a lot about what his corner and his friends and everything. Like, you don't want to kick a dog when it's down. You don't want to be like, you know, nah, you got your ass whooped or nah, you didn't win that fight. They're just kind of listening. And I was like, it was it was just so interesting to watch. And it, I always like those Showtime All Access epilogues after the fact. Those to me are better than the the all this shit you hear up to the, the pre-fight. Because everybody says the same thing before a fight. Really, I'm in the best shape of my life. You, I mean, you're 42 years old. There's no way you're in better shape than when you was 26. You know, I'm in the best shape of my life. I got years to go. Uh, I'm definitely going to win this fight. Uh, he don't know what I got coming. It, it, it's the same. It's different, but different shit talking, but kind of the same shit. Uh, but after the fight, I love watching fighters, their psyche, what they go through. Uh, you know, but like I said, Adrian is not stupid. People say whatever, but I'm like, he's he put that black hat on and he wants to be the bad guy and bad guys sell tickets. And to any fighter out there that's like, thinks, oh, I'm not getting the numbers that I want and blah, blah, blah. And I'm not getting what I want. Start talking major shit about everybody and just say crazy shit, even if you don't mean it and watch and, and watch how people want to see you fight because they want to see you get knocked out. That's why you watch it. Floyd and as soon as Floyd fought Oscar De La Hoya, and that was the first time I saw 24 seven on HBO, man, Floyd just went no respect. Fuck everything about Oscar, blah, blah, blah. I was like this, damn. I was thinking this guy's a dick. That's literally, I'm watching it. Like he is a dick. And I was hoping De La Hoya would beat his ass when I first saw it. And then I started to realize, oh, after about the third 24-7, I go, oh, now I know what Floyd's doing. He's selling the fight. This dude is putting so much money in his pocket because people are watching his fights to see him get beat, to see him get knocked out. I was like, it was, it's brilliant, brilliant marketing. Because, you know, now that I know Floyd, uh, you know, he's, he's just, he's cool when them cameras ain't on. He's just cool and generous. Just a nice dude. But as soon as them cameras come on and it's fight, it's time to fight. That motherfucker talk. But I, you know, Floyd is the point where he believes it though. And, and he rightly so nobody's ever beat him. Now he can really say I'm the baddest man on the planet and I'm better than you. Uh, Floyd, I think the best line Floyd ever said at all the 24 sevens, he's getting ready to fight Shane Mosley and Shane had like the curl and his outfit was all wrong. He goes, what the fuck? What the fuck is you? Hot tub time machine? <laughs> I lost it when he said that shit. What the fuck? Some motherfuckers in a hot tub time machine. Uh, and then Shane was the only one I see caught Floyd where his knee buckled. In the second round of that fight, Shane Mosley, I hit Floyd flush. And you saw Floyd's knee go bink. And then he grabbed onto Shane's arm and held on. And then he just had to get his bearings back. And I think it was crazy how that was a turning point of that fight. Because Floyd's knee... Leg buckled. He clearly got caught. You know, let me gather myself. And then Shane, I think, got so excited by the fact that he, he was the first guy to really, really hurt Floyd. He shot his load. 
It was like he had nothing left the rest of the fight. He couldn't let his hands go. I think, like, uh, you know, I don't know how boxers are, but, you know, breathing and excitement and all that shit goes into why guys get tired. And I think that's also what makes Floyd so great is he's so relaxed in the ring. He's just, just another day. It's like, I don't know. It's like me getting on an elliptical for 20 minutes is how Floyd looks at a fight. He's just, all right, I'm just going, I'm going to get this. I know I'm better than everybody else. Blah, blah, blah. So, anyways, I thought that was, if you get a chance, watch that Showtime. Just go to YouTube, type in Showtime All Access. And just watch all the different fights that they've had. And, and then the, the epilogues are the ones I like. And that's the ones they air after the fight. Uh, it was interesting to watch the Adrian Broner one, though, with, with Pacquiao. But all of them are interesting when you, when you got big fights like that. Uh, okay, I, I did say I was in Pittsburgh. I'm in Pittsburgh this weekend. Thursday, Friday, Saturday, January 31st to February 2nd. Uh, last weekend, I was in Phoenix. Every time we go to Phoenix, it just reiterates why it's one of my favorite cities in the country by far. I, I tell Scott, that Scottsdale area, I mean, it's just there's good restaurants. The weather's perfect. Uh, they got, I mean, they got like healthy spots to eat at too. Like literally you could be there for a year and eat at a different restaurant every day. Like a decent restaurant. I'm not talking about Chili's. I'm not talking about BJ's. I'm not talking about In-N-Out. I'm talking about really good restaurants and not, not high end, just good. Like I went to brunch every day. I just, I was eating like breakfast at like one o'clock and it was all good. I'm gluten free. There was a lot of options, but it was funny, man. Cause my first day in Phoenix, I get there on Thursday. So I don't want to do anything Thursday. So Friday morning I go to the gym. There's a gym uh, right next to my hotel and I walk in and I just see all these big motherfuckers, man. And I'm like, damn, the trainers are big here. And then I'm watching them and they're not really training. They're, everybody's doing their own thing. And I'm not talking about one or two. I'm talking about 15 big dudes and about 10 big chicks. Just in shape though. Not like huge, just really in shape. But they were doing exercises. They weren't just like hitting the bench or hitting the squats. Like they had like the bands. They were really stretching their legs out. And then they were like doing these lunges and making sure like they were really working like the outside of their hips and stuff. And I was like, what are they doing? Then I look at their shorts. They were all WWE wrestlers. The Royal Rumble was in Phoenix on Sunday, the same weekend I'm there. So all these guys were WWE wrestlers. And it hit me how out the loop I am when it comes to wrestling. Because I didn't know any of their names. I knew like their faces, but I didn't know their names. Like I'm looking for like Superfly Snooker, uh, the Killer Bees, or I don't know, Rowdy Rowdy Piper. I guess everybody, I said that on Instagram. Everybody says all the rest of these names have passed away. Uh, but WWE wrestling, it was cool because I, I talked to a couple of them and everybody was cool, man. Everybody was nice guys, nice girls and everything. But man, those WWE fans. I don't, it's weird when you see a grown man with a fake WWE belt that looks like he got it at Toys R Us, wearing around his waist, wearing it around his waist, walking around Phoenix, and then they'll have like their muscle shirts, but they don't have any muscles. They're just like, they got these shirts with the, with the, what do they call it? The tassels on it and stuff. And, and then, uh, the, none, no WWE fan, WWE fans are really in good shape. You figure they'd be in better shape. If you're worshiping wrestlers, you're probably going to be in the gym and work out just like guys that watch a lot of basketball and like basketball. Usually they, they shoot hoops. Uh, you'll see them at the Y shooting hoops. Uh, but, WWE wrestler, wrestling fans, ooh, I don't want to stereotype, but I got a feeling there's a lot of porn on their computers, a lot. I don't see those guys getting a lot of pussy. I'm sorry. I just, <laughs> I don't. They were walking around. I was like, ah, yeah. <laughs> it, they, they, a lot of those guys, I, I wouldn't be shocked if they was on the Catch a Predator. The ones like standing, not, not just casual WWE fans. I'm talking about the rabbit standing outside of the hotel waiting to get a glimpse of your favorite wrestler. Those fans. The ones that have the pictures, like the glossy pictures and they got a Sharpie and they're waiting on them to come out so they can sign it or any memorabilia that they can get signed. Grown men clearly trying to put it on eBay or, or anything like that. Those guys, those are the ones I can see on the Catch Predator. I could easily see them walking into a kitchen and Chris Hansen's there like, hey, what are you doing? No, I just, no, I just, uh, it says here on your email 
that you were supposed to bring condoms and wine coolers. No, I always carry wine coolers with me. I just like the taste of it. I love, I love, no, I love the orange and mango combo. Yeah, I just love it. No, I always have condoms on me. You just never know when it could pop off. Really? Oh, you're not going to, can I just go? Yeah, you can go. <laughs> and then they go and they're always arrested in the front yard. Uh, you know, I just, no, I just, you know, yeah, I just email her, but I just want to make sure, you know, she knew um, this wasn't okay. You know, I was just looking out for her because I got a daughter and, you know, I, I wouldn't be okay with that. So I just want to make sure she's okay. So that's why I came in the kitchen at two in the morning with condoms and wine coolers. Yeah. Yeah, I did send her, yeah, I did send her a, I, I sent her a video on my penis. Yeah, I did. Yeah, yeah, but it was blurry. It wasn't my penis. No, no, no. No, my my left balls hangs lower than my right. As you can see in this picture, those are even balls. So that's not my penis. That was a fake penis I just sent a picture of. Uh, okay. Well, I'm looking at your email. <laughs> those are the guys that was outside the hotel. And the the not the bad part, but the weird part was the hotel I was at was where a lot of the WWE wrestlers were staying. They were there was two different hotels they were staying at. The one I was in in Phoenix, and then there was another one down the street. And so every night I walked out, it was just these fucking weird looking motherfuckers, man. They it was very much like the Hills Have Eyes type fans. Now, if you just go to a WWE wrestling match and you buy tickets and you go to Phoenix and you're enjoying the weekend there, that's different. That's just dudes having a good time letting off some steam. The ones that sit outside the hotel with the glossy pictures and the, the wearing the belts around town on a Friday night at a bar, you got a fake Toys R Us looking WWE belt. Those are the guys I'm talking about. Those are the guys, if you check the computer, oh my God, there's going to be so much porn on that motherfucker, I guarantee it. Because they're not pulling a lot. I don't know if you know that. And it reminded me of when I was in Vegas and we were shooting Think Like a Man too. And you see every Thursday, the group of bachelors come in. And then Sunday, you always see them leave defeated. But Thursday, they come in and they're like, they always say, Vegas ain't ready for us. We're about to do this. And you can tell by the group, I'd be looking like, you guys should just get strippers and call tonight. Don't go out party. Don't waste your money popping bottles and getting tables because it's not popping off. Just go get some strippers, guys. Save your money. And in the long run, you're going to spend less money. It, you just see them. You see when they come in, like the group of 10 dudes. Vegas ain't ready for us. Really? You're going to do some shit to Vegas that they haven't seen? Come on now. Uh, <laughs> that's what it reminded me of watching these guys running around the streets of, of Phoenix for three days. But uh, I tell you what, it made for some interesting uh, uh, people watching. That was I, I really enjoyed that. I really enjoyed watching all the people in Phoenix this weekend. But like I said, just that is one of my favorite cities. Scottsdale and Phoenix, man. And it's weird. Like everyone I talk to, they all say the same thing. I was like, man. When I say Phoenix, they're like, man. City's just fun, man. I can't explain. It's just fun. The vibe's good there. It's just, it's just a, it's a dope ass city, man. It's dope. I love it there. Uh, so don't ask me why I moved to Northern California. I don't know. But man, I could I could easily live in Scottsdale and Phoenix. Easy. No problem. Uh okay, so this weekend I'm in Pittsburgh. And then next weekend, uh, which would be the week at all, oh, I'm in Atlanta, February 8th at State Farm Arena. And then I'm in Nashville, Tennessee, February 9th and 10th at Zanies in Nashville. Uh the shows have already sold out in Nashville. We just added two more. So we added a second show Sunday and a third show Saturday uh, in Nashville. And then February 8th, I'm coming to Atlanta the week after the Super Bowl. Uh, I'm with, uh, oh, there's a group of, I think, some more. I mean, that's the basketball arena where the Hawks play. Uh, some more me, I think, Earthquake. I'm not sure who's on. I don't know who's on lineup. There's like six, seven of us comics on that. It's a big show. Uh, but I hope Pittsburgh fans, uh, it's funny, man. Every time I go there, Pittsburgh always comes out and shows a lot of love. But it's always funny, man, because as soon as I go up there, I get booed because I'm I'm a Cincinnati guy. I'm a Bengals fan. So initially, I'll be like, what's up, Pittsburgh? And then at some point during the show, I'll say where I'm from. It always gets like a 30-second boo. So I think I'm going to lie this year and tell, say I'm from Erie. Be like, hey, what's up, man? I'm from a small town, Erie, Pennsylvania. Uh, just so I, did, I don't get that 30-second boo at the Pittsburgh Improv. All right. So listen, um, I'm going to wrap this up. But again... Uh, very, very, very 
disheartened, sad, angry, just what happened to the Jesse Smollett this past weekend, this past, you know, just last night. Uh, well, this is going to air Thursday, but Monday night in, uh, in uh, Chicago of all cities, man, you expect something like that to happen in some, sm- when you hear a race crime like that, you expect to have in some small town in the South, not in Chicago, Illinois, big metropolitan city, big melting pot city where they have every race, religion, culture there. Uh, you don't expect it to happen there. So like I said, I'm anxious to see if Donald Trump reaches out, even if Jesse didn't want to take his call, the fact that he reached out would say a lot uh, to a lot of people um, because you was quick to reach out to the Covington Catholic kids that wore the Make America Great hat. You know, so if he doesn't reach out, that should say a lot. But, you know, we always know what he's, and it's, you know, I've talked to people that was on The Apprentice uh, and the first thing that comes to my mouth is, you really like that? What's he like? Like numerous people I know that have been on The Apprentice. I know at least seven people that was on The Apprentice. And every time I ask him, what's he really like? And they all say the same thing. They go, hey, he's arrogant, he's an asshole, but they didn't see this type of behavior. They didn't know this was coming. You know, and I think with Trump, I think it goes back to uh, when I was watching the Florida governor's race, when they, the one of the candidates was talking to another candidate. He goes, I don't think you're a racist. He said, I think the racists think you're racist. That's why I, I was like, damn, that's exactly what I've always felt about Donald Trump. I was like, mm, I don't think you're necessarily racist, but I think the racists think you're racist. And you're not saying anything to defuse it because I think you know it could cost you votes. Uh, that's why it, it makes you appreciate John McCain so much. John McCain, when he ran for president, he spoke up. When that lady said Barack Obama is a Muslim and could be a terrorist, he goes, nope, nope, nope. He's a good man. We just have fundamental fundamental differences of opinions on how this country should be ran. And honestly, that probably cost John McCain votes when he said that. But it spoke a lot about who he is as a man. Uh, and it's going to speak a lot about Donald Trump if he doesn't reach out to Jesse or condemn these two racist bigots that attacked him. Uh, So hopefully by the time this airs, that will happen or it won't happen. Uh, So we'll see. Um, Oh, and the reason I had said that earlier, I'm sorry I got sidetracked. The reason I had said I'm I'm not quick to just, you know, just because these guys yell out Donald Trump. And then I don't want people to, to think I'm condoning Donald Trump or think that. Not at all. I'm just one to be like, you could just throw out any name to to get a reaction. And I think these guys, that's what they did. They jumped the gay black dude and they threw out Donald Trump because they know once you throw his name out there, it's going to get a reaction. Uh, the bottom line is these dudes are just ignorant. I hope they go to jail. I hope they get caught. That's the bottom line. Uh, it, and I remember like mm, 15, 16 years ago in my hometown of Oxford, Ohio, Miami of Ohio, like one of the it, not the black student union, but the black, uh, one of the black, like, not, it's not even a dorm. It was like a, a conference center where all the black, black students there. And, 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 and there was like, um, it's not a fraternity. There wasn't no, I don't think, I don't even think Miami of Ohio has, uh, I don't think black and, uh, fraternities or sororities have their own houses, but it was a place where black students could go and have fellowship and congregate and stuff. Uh, but it got trashed. It got like somebody came and broke all the computers and they they broke in and, and just basically trashed the whole room and they wrote KKK on the wall and did all this other stuff. And then kind of find out it was two black kids that did it. I was like, oh. and then I don't know why they did it. They did it for a reaction or something. And ever since then, because I was quick to 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 go off on the KKK and everything else. Then when I found out that, and that happened in my hometown when I was around at that time. I always like take a step like, whoa, hold on. Why would somebody do that? Oh, it's to get a reaction. It's to cause chaos and 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 make this country even more divided as soon as you say that when you do something like that. Uh, so that's why I was like, you know, because I, I, some, some people are on my Instagram page are really just condemning the two guys that did it. And other people 
are, they're, it's weird. They're not even bringing up the two guys that did the assault. They're just bringing up Donald Trump. And I'm like, no, I mean, Donald Trump, uh, they said his name to get a reaction, to get people all fired up. And it just causes more divide by saying that name when you attack a, a, a black dude like that. Uh, so that's why I'm like, just let's bring it down a little bit and let's let, really realize what's going on. It's just two ignorant dudes that threw out his name because they knew once they threw out his name, it was going to get a reaction and be big news. That's why they did it. Uh, I guarantee the two dudes that did this have never met Donald Trump. And Donald Trump had never met these two dudes. Uh, but I'm anxious to see what Donald Trump's reaction is to this. I know I've said it about 20 times, but uh, uh, what do I think is going to happen? I don't think he's going to bring it up or he's going to reach out. But Mm, that would be terrible if he does it. Uh, so anyways, all right. Uh, Should have ended this on a happy note, but I'm really not. So, all right. This is Gary Owen with the Get Some Podcast. If you want to listen to my podcast, just go to iTunes, search Gary Owen, hashtag Get Some.